Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to session RETT301, Core Elements of Digital Transformation. This is the story of how a $6 billion fashion retailer leveraged AWS and its partners to digitally transform their organization. My name is Aditya Pindiala. I go by Addy, as my colleagues and friends call me. I'm a senior solutions architect at AWS, and I specialize in the retail vertical. With me here on stage, we have two senior leaders from Tapestry, Fabio Luzzi, Vice President, Data Science and Analytics, and Rehan Mubashir, who's Director of Cloud Platforms, Architecture and Engineering. Firstly, uh, it's, it's an honor to host you both. Thank you for being here and agreeing to tell your story, Tapestry's transformation story, to the wide audience here at reInvent. So before we go into thick of things, um, I want to quickly introduce introduced to you who Tapestry is and what they have done so far. As many of you know, or might know, Tapestry is the parent company of three iconic fashion brands, Coach, Stuart Weitzman, and Kate Spade, New York. And also, there are no strangers to reInvent or AWS. They have presented multiple times at reInvent, and most recently, last year, they spoke about their migration journey which is how they were able to move their workloads from on-prem to cloud, and how they were able to close up to nine data centers in the process. They also spoke about the advances that they have made within their data organization, and how they were able to impact their top-line revenue using the migrated workloads. And today, they're going to talk about digital transformation. So um, who, who is this session helpful for? So if you are a member of an organization or, an, or a company that's <clears throat> undergoing digital transformation, or you're just an individual who would like to know what is the buzz about digital transformation and why is it important, um, and what are the foundational pieces that needs to be set up, this is a session for you. Just going through the agenda, we have Fabio here first, who's going to talk through about what digital transformation is and why is it important. And why is it difficult for a retailer organization of their size to execute the digital transformation? He's also going to talk about the foundations that they have set in place uh, from data integration standpoint and data accumulation standpoint. And then hand it over to Rehan, who's going to talk about a really cool in-house built infrastructure as core platform. This has quite a few capabilities, which Rehan will cover in detail. Um, it'll also, he'll also talk about how they were able to leverage this IAC platform to modernize and accelerate their digital transformation. We've got a lot to cover, so without further delay, I invite Fabio to take up the stage and share with you their journey. Thank you, Adi. Can I have the clicker? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you for, thank you for being here. All right, so we are talking about digital transformation in the retail fashion business. So my, I think my main goal today is to, to try to explain how difficult that is uh, and beautiful at the same time. So, uh, so I've been in Tapestry for five years almost, and we've been transforming since day one. So today I was hoping to share with you, you know, a little bit of the story of this journey, why we think it's important, why we think it's difficult, and what's the outcome, hopefully by giving you real examples um, of um, you know what we mean by uh, actually transforming the business. So, <clears throat> so again, right? So I have a few slides to introduce the concept of digital transformation. I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with the concept, but the goal is really to take you into the mindset of uh, of our reality, which is retail and fashion, and the complexity of the business. And then, um, you know, and then eventually we'll get into after describing the business why it's complex and what's the goal of the transformation, what's the outcome that we are trying to get. But then we really drill down onto what we believe it's the core foundation of that business transformation and what we build to enable and scale that. <clears throat> so just quick slide to introduce the concept, right? So what we mean by digital transformation, it's really about putting the technology at the center of the business strategy. 
So it goes across the entire business uh, ecosystem. Um, you know, it changes. So we talk about leveraging technology to change the way of working, to change the existing processes, to change people and culture above all. So that does not mean it's, it's something that is very important to understand. That doesn't mean that we put technology in front of, of our goals, of our vision, of our North Star. We always think of technology as an enabler of the transformation. So there is a feedback loop across all these elements because you know, we, keep, we keep improving and tweaking the technology based on what and how we want to transform the business. <clears throat> So why, why, do we, why, why do we go through uh, all this effort? Why do we think transforming a traditional company that has been around for a long time, if you think about it, Coach has been around since 1941. So obviously it's a successful business, it's wor it works fine, uh, but it's not a native technology company, right? So why do we go through the effort of transforming this traditional retail organization into a more technology-driven uh, uh, platform? So at the end of the day, I mean, the, the benefits of the transformation are well, are well documented, but uh, it, it really goes down into creating flexibility for the organization. So the idea is really to create a platform that, is, uh, that gives a common denominator across all the processes. And uh, we will go through um, our value chain, but you know, it's, it's really taking a, disjoint, a bunch of disjointed processes that go from designing the product, to building the product supply chain, all the way down to selling the product and taking all those disjointed processes and uh, creating a common platform, a common technology platform where all these processes can live. So they all share the same information, all the data flow through the platform. And uh, so it's about creating that flexibility and um, that um, adapted, adapt, adaptability. Uh, to the point that also by leveraging AI and ML, we're able to predict the change and we're able to, re to react to the change even before, before that happens. Even for events that are very difficult to predict and impossible, like you know, the, the black swan, like uh, um, COVID outbreaks or supply chain disruptions, it's well documented that companies that invest in digital transformation, data and analytics, are better placed to, 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 to um, react and survive uh, during those uh, tough times. Because they can get an early read of what's happening uh, before and they can react in time. <clears throat> A little bit of history. I saw the, how do we get to digital transformation? And uh, so obviously, you know, we start from, from when the computer was created, right? So in that case, we, we, we call it digi digitization, when we really stopped using bookkeeping paper and we started using computers. Then we went from there to digitalization, which means it's not a real transformation yet, right? Because if you think about it, we are still using folders. When I read that uh, during my research, it, it struck me, right? So it's true, like, you know, we, we automated a lot of things and we made a lot of things easier because we digitalized them, but we're, we're still operating in the same ways that we were operating before. So it's not a real transformation. Then we, today we are living through uh, you know, digital transformation. How do we really forget about how we were doing things before and we redesign processes from, the, from, from, uh, from scratch and we transform the way we work, processes, people, et cetera, et cetera, with obviously having a goal in mind. I think this is it's very important, this slide, because sometimes for some reality, including our reality, it's very difficult to jump straight to, into digital transformation. But it's, in most cases, you really go from step two to step three. Before getting to a real transformation, you have to digitalize some of the processes. <clears throat> and then why is it difficult? OK, so it, it really comes down to people, processes, and technology. So technology is the easiest, right? So once you know what the North Star is, once you know what your vision is, how to implement, uh, once you know how to measure the success of it. You know, technology, if you have the right team in place, if you have the right technology stack in place, it's not difficult. What's difficult is processes and people. So processes, um, it's very important, again, to understand that the technology, it's not in front of it, right? So you, we don't put technology in front of our use cases. It's the opposite. We leverage technology to achieve a goal. But there is a feedback loop between processes and technology. So, you know, we keep improving that technology based on the feedback that we get from the processes, and we transform that processes by leveraging the technology. 
So it's, it's about changing existing processes because now we have a modern technology in place that, that we can leverage to do things that were not possible before. As they say, right, engineering is the closest thing to magic. So, you know, it's really about re-engineering processes by leveraging modern technology. But then the most difficult thing to do for a transformation based on our experience is people. And when it comes to people, it's really about adoption. It's not easy to adopt new solution because people is used to, uh, you know, work with, with uh, processes, uh, technology that they've been using for a long time. So what we found out during our journey is that, you know, the very important thing by facilitating that adoption of transformation is creating trust. We've been working with Harvard and MIT on some uh, specific use cases. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, about it a little later, but you know, Harvard uh, Innovation Lab helped us design experiments to improve our allocation process. So you know, imagine moving goods, finished goods from your distribution centers into stores. So you know, it's about putting the, 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 the right item in the right quantity in the right store at the right time. And we, you know, we designed and we built uh, demand forecasting models that we leveraged to, um, to uh, optimize that allocation process with the goal of reducing stockouts, especially for, for the most popular styles. So during that process, by, work by closely working with our allocation team and with IT, we really created a feedback loop that really helped us imp even improve the models, the, the, the forecasting models. So by doing that, we built that trust that really made when the solution was ready to be implemented and deployed, it was much easier to adopt by the allocators because they work together with us. So the third element to me that is the most difficult, again, to, for, for a, a successful digital transformation is people. And when it comes to people, it's about trust. So that's why I wanted to stress that. But if you're curious, the paper, the, 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 the work we did with MIT at Harvard is now a working paper. And it really talks about not only about the technology, but the, the people aspect, so that, that uh, trust and adoption. All right, so at this point, you know, we have a, an idea of what we mean by, by, by uh, digital transformation. Why do we think it's, it's important and why is it difficult? Now, let's get into our reality, right? So this is, we're talking about retail and fashion brands. So in this slide, we have a quick description of our, what we call our value chain, just to, just to explain the, com just to cover the complexity of, of, of the business. I'm sure I'm most, uh, a lot of you are familiar with retail and fashion. Also, just to give you a better idea and more information about our company, so Tapestry, it's, uh, so, uh, it's an omni-channel business. We have physical location in different channels, outlet, retail. So we have hundreds of, sto uh, hundreds of stores across the globe. We're a global company. But we also have a pretty big um, uh, online uh, presence. Um, so, but the good thing about Tapestry, for, for, for me especially being the data, in the data business, is that we are direct to consumer. So we are a data-rich company. For the most part, 95% of our revenue comes from, from our channel. So we're direct to consumers, which means we own our transactional data. So this, this, this uh, uh, picture, the value chain, right? So imagine when you, so let's take the, the example of um, leather goods, right? So we build bags, beautiful leather, by the way, the leather comes from Italy, beautiful leather bags. So we start from designing the bags, so, you know, the, you, uh, there's different teams that work together. Merchandising, global merchandise planning, because they need to understand, you know, how to build the assortment, how many, how many SKUs, how many models of the same style for that season. They need to build, having the target in mind. So, uh, planners, merchandising, and designer working together to decide what's the menu, right? What do we put on the menu? Then, then buying comes in and decides how much to invest. So how much we should buy of that, of, that, of that assortment. And then once they agree on that, they start the supply chain. So they start building the, the, the actual product. So end-to-end -end supply chains. And then logistics, right? How do we move goods from raw material, or from the finished goods from the suppliers, mostly in Asia, or to Europe, North America, et cetera, et cetera. So logistics. And then uh, once the product ends up in the distribution center, how do we move it from the distribution center to the stores or from the suppliers to the distribution centers? And then obviously the traditional CRM marketing sales, uh, et cetera. So it's a very complex business. But again, why is it important to transform this 
to leverage modern technology is that because traditionally all these steps tends to be disjointed. Dis disjointed. So if you think about it, the output of each step is, the in is, is an input to the next step. So, and there is a lot of collaboration that needs to happen be be between all these, these teams. So in a traditional way, you know, these teams work offline using Excel, PowerPoint. They communicate using traditional platforms like email, calls. So, you know, there is a lot of lost in translations. Often the same data doesn't flow through. So that's why it's very important to, um, we believe that by transforming this into a more of a technology platform, we create uh, much more flexibility. We are creating much more flexibility and we see the results already. So anyway, so it's more points on why it's a complex business. Very long lead times. It takes almost one year from when you design a product to when that product is, is available uh, in the stores. Consumers' uh, preferences are very hard to predict, obviously, because there is uh, also uh, a lot of competitors, of good competitors around. Consumer price sensitivity is very um, uh, variable. Uh, you know, so it's very, when it comes to pricing and promotion, it's a very complex strategy to build. Highly competitive environment, you know, customer acquisition and loyalty. Uh, and then obviously, you know, changes in microeconomic environments. Uh, supply chain disruption is an example, right? So everybody was affected by that because of the COVID outbreak, et cetera, et cetera. So our company, you know, like we, we, we source raw material and we build products in different parts of the world. So obviously we were affected by that. So this is to explain how difficult the business is, hence how difficult it is to transform it. But as I was saying before, it's very important when it, we talk about business trans, uh, digital transformation to have a vision, to have a North Star, to have a goal. Because it's not about building the technology, it's about, it's about enabling a technology to support our goals, our vision. So on this slide, basically, this should give you an idea of our landscape. Um, this is what we really mean by digital transformation. So for each step on the value chains, there are opportunity that by leveraging technology, by leveraging data, automation, et cetera, we can make the business more data-driven, more customer-centric, more predictive, and more automated, all along the supply chain. And being direct to consumer, by having access to transactional data, it gives us the opportunity to, to do that. Um, so, you know, obviously this is a busy slide, but just to give you maybe a double click on some of them, supply chain, right? So that's a, that's a traditional example, very, very popular now due to all the disruptions that are happening. But, you know, by digitally transforming that process, you introduce more visibility end to end. So you, you, can, er, you can get an early read into delays in production and, uh, you know, um, supplier's performance, supplier selection. And, and then, then eventually, when you get more sophisticated, you get more into predicting. So uh, by predicting demand forecasting at a raw material level, you can pre-buy raw material so you can shorten that long lead time that we were talking about. So supply chain, it's obviously one of the area that we are looking to, we are, we've been transforming uh, by giving more visibility and predictability. Another example is around uh, logistics, right? So we move a lot of goods around from supplier to the distribution center, from the distribution centers to the stores, and we have multi DC, so we, we have multiple distribution centers. So which means, you know, when the product is ready, actually even before, when you submit the purchase order and you say, okay, I want to build 1,000s of this specific uh, tote. Okay, when it's ready, where are you gonna send it? Are you gonna send it to North America East Coast or are you gonna send it to North America West Coast? You know, traditionally, there, is a lot, there would be a lot of gut checking based on historical data, et cetera, et cetera. But the opportunity there, was what we're doing is we're really leveraging demand forecasting model uh, to uh, really predict where the demand will be. And we are, we are sending the, the finished goods in the right distribution center based on where we predict the demand will be. And the goal is really to balance, to balance the, the inventory, right? To have the right inventory in the right place so you don't have to rebalance and send goods, resend goods around the globe because now, you know, people that are really buying that good, they don't live near in the right area, but they live on the opposite side of, of, the, of the country, so you have to rebalance the inventory. So again, that's just an example. 
another, another example is, uh, so just to keep it simple, behind these, these use cases and transformation, there are really few elements. Uh, when it comes to data and analytics, which is demand forecasting. So we, we, we built a demand forecasting platform that can be plugged in based on the different use cases. Obviously, the, 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 the value chain is very long, so it's easier to predict demand downstream when, it, when you're closer to selling the good, when the good is ready. And it's more difficult when you go upstream. So we, when you're thinking of, okay, what, what should I design? What should I build? Because that's, that's like nine months, and it's very difficult to predict demand nine months before. So you know, we, we build a, a forecasting studio that help us predict demand at different levels, style levels, queue level. And we use that to optimize different processes. Uh, so the, 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 the merchandising process to build the assortment, the buying process, etc. So there is a lot of demand forecasting, and also there is a lot of clustering. Uh, just to mention a few data science, uh, and ML and AI. Forecasting and clustering are really at the base of uh, ML and AI here. Uh, but you know, to enable that, we really needed to transform and build that technology platform that, uh, to create a common denominator across the value chain. So, uh, okay, so today's presentation, so obviously digital transformation, as you hopefully, I'm, I'm giving you a sense, there is a lot that goes into it. But today we wanted to focus on really the, what we believe it's the foundation. So we came to realize that at the base of everything, there is data, right? So I can't, it's hard to think of a process that does not involve exchange of data and information from two or more endpoints. So our vision, so that's why we're saying like the smallest unit of digital transformation is data. So how do we enable and build a platform that can scale when it comes to transforming the business? It's about creating a, a platform that can help us exchange information and data in any, in any shape and form when needed anywhere. So for us, it was very important to build a data ecosystem and a, a data exchange framework that can help us do that. <clears throat> and this is the architecture. I mean, obviously, this is, um, this is a very high-level architecture. But so this is what we believe is the foundation of a digital transformation, being able to exchange data fast and in any, any shape or form. So we built this, uh, obviously, we built this on AWS. We call it the Tapestry Data Exchange. Uh, just to give, quick, give a quick overview of the, of the slide. So on the left, we have the sources. So th those are just examples, but we have multiple data sources. So data coming from everywhere, from stores, from POS, online, uh, et cetera. So the, this, the, the elements that you see on the left, it's really about the orchestration and the ingestion of the data. Then inside the big box, we have the data lake, which is the raw, the raw, uh, where the raw data is stored. And uh, it's mainly three elements, Athena, Lake Formation, and Amazon S3. And then on the, on the right, it's the more curated uh, data ecosystem, so data warehousing, if you will. For that, we are using, using Snowflake. And then on the bottom is uh, the actual operational data store. So it's our API ecosystem. So how do we, uh, how do we uh, create a system that can help us exchange those data uh, um, across the organization? So basically, our data exchange became the backbone, the data backbone of the company, now feeding enterprise level solutions um, <clears throat> everywhere. So, like, so our data ecosystem is feeding our loyalty program, clienteling. Uh, there is customer lookup every time you go in the store and transact. Obviously, all, all the GDPR, uh, CCPA, um, but it can scale. So every time there is a new use case, now we can build new APIs uh, to feed that system um, easily. Uh, just to give you an idea. So again, right? So we wanted to build this foundational data ecosystem in a way that can scale. And I'll give you some stats uh, in a minute. But basically, you know, the, the, the typical, so we use Snowflake because we believe it can scale fast when it comes to curated data. But obviously, we wanted a serverless and microservice architecture and a stateless architecture. So, you know, every time there is a handshake between two endpoints, you don't want to keep the handshake, right? So once the exchange is done, you just want to uh, release that. <sighs> uh, 
Uh, and then just to give you some stats, uh, so you know we have a lot of, uh, it's a big ecosystem, 250 terabytes of data and growing. We have over 100 data sources. We integrate now with uh, over 200 um, systems ac across the enterprise. We, on this slide, I have 2 million API code per day, but we actually broke that record. During Black Friday last week, we did 3 million API calls, no problem. So the system scales with no issues. And uh, we are powering more than 50 enterprise level applications. The, the, the system, just to give an example um, of one of the solutions that this system is, is feeding, is the allocation system. So, um, you know, again, right? So think about moving goods from our distribution centers to the stores. The goal is to reduce stockouts. So being able to, you know, every time a customer enters the stores and is looking for a specific product, he finds it. Because every time there is a stock out, there is a lost sale opportunity. So we wanted to minimize that stock out to, to reduce that lost sale opportunity. So we build demand forecasting model that predicts demand, how many SKUs of that specific SKU that we're going to sell at a store level by week. And then uh, we are now feeding that forecast into our location model. So with the results, so we were able to do two things. And this is just to give an example of a concrete example of outcome when it comes to digitally transforming an existing process. You know, traditionally, the process was based on uh, naive um, predictive models based on uh, moving averages, just looking at the same period last year, taking an average, and then using some, you know, some obvi obviously the experience of the, the, of the allocators. But that today is replaced with a model that predicts how many units are going to be sold. Uh, for, for that specific student that, in that specific store. So by doing that, we achieve two things. We reduce stockouts up to, up to 34%. So that's, that's huge. It translates into millions of dollars. But we also made the process more efficient. So we, out, by, uh, we automated the process by um, almost 40% which means for the high selling products that are easy to predict, obviously when there is more data, it's easier to forecast. For those products, we high confidence, we can allocate them without a human touching the system. So we were able to automate and improve efficiency by 40%. And we believe there is more room for automation. <clears throat> so that was my overview of, uh, you know, our journey of transforming the, the business and what we believe it's at the core of that transformation, which is you know, enabling data exchange in an efficient way. Now, um, but obviously, you know, that's just a part of it. The, there is more the discussion of moving to the cloud. Obviously, it's not easy. So Rihan will talk about how do we, you know, how do we leverage infrastructure as a code to really maximize the benefits of moving uh, all our um, data centers and processes to, to the cloud. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Fabio. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. We will get into the foundations and the platform in a bit. Uh, before that, let's take a moment uh, to first understand, like, why did we build this platform and what problems we were trying to solve? So here's where it all started. We initiated our enterprise cloud migration journey around three years back. At the time, we had multiple data centers, pending hardware refreshes, desperate DR mechanisms. We were unable to scale with growth. To address this, we decided to migrate to cloud. The cloud migration kind of resolved areas of concern around agility and growth. We were able to close nine data centers drastically reduced the server count, dealt with legacy operating system end of life. Overall, it was a great achievement. But as with majority of cloud migrations, our cloud migration too was mostly lift and shift. Which brings us to post-migration challenges. We were unable to take advantage of cloud native services. The team was unacquainted dealing with modernized workloads. In fact, most of the team members only had experience with legacy 3 tier architectures. This was a big showstopper for our enterprise digital transformation. To address these challenges, we needed to build a scalable ISC platform for enabling Tapestry to seamlessly deploy modernized workloads in a freeter, consistent, and repeatable manner, ensuring security and governance. And here's the platform we built. 
it has all the components needed for deploying and managing any kind of modernized workload. I know this is a busy slide, but not to worry. I'll go through each of these boxes on the slide, and you will see how these components solve different problems. If you follow me left to right under the platform core components, the first box you see is for standardized architectural patterns. Let us see what problem this box is solving. Imagine you need to build an external facing application with multiple internal and external integrations. As a first step, you start with an architecture diagram. You must ensure it is secure, compliant, aligns with well-architected framework, and finally get all the required approvals for security and compliance. Usually this takes a lot of time. To solve this problem, we first conducted a deep assessment of tapestry and industry use cases and created a library of pre-vetted best practices based standardized architectural patterns. These patterns can be leveraged for any modernized workload. Currently, we maintain around uh, 30 plus reference architectures, which can be readily used or tweaked a little to fit any uh, use case. This drastically reduces the time as you don't have to create one from scratch. All you need to do based on you, your use case is to pick an existing pre-vetted pattern and finalize the design. We'll go through some of the examples as we go through the slides, uh, showing some reference architectures what we have made available in our library. By the way, not trying to be prescriptive here, but I mean you can use a tool which works best for you for this uh, patterns and templating the patterns. We use Lucy charts. Now that we have these standardized patterns, we needed a way to incorporate baseline security into our IIC code and to reuse the IIC code without having to write it from scratch every time we have a new use case. At the same time, we also wanted to make the provisioning repeatable and consistent. To meet these requirements, if you see the next two boxes, we created, pre-vetted, parameterized IIC modules and IIC templates. The parameterization of IIC modules allows us to reuse the IIC code without having to write it from scratch for any given use case. And the IIC templates makes the entire provisioning process repeatable and consistent. Currently, we maintain around 75 plus IIC modules. We also maintain around like 15 plus uh, IIC templates, which again, like uh, your standardized patterns and IIC uh, modules are pre-vetted, CCOA line, and also conform to the best practices. Later in the presentation, we'll see a few examples of these components. Now that we have the IIC templates, we needed a way to use these templates to deploy and provision workloads while ensuring governance. To accomplish this, as you can see the next box, we created and established a standardized provisioning workflow which incorporates approvals and is auditable. As we go forward in the presentation, we will see the actual provisioning workflow. Moving on, to enable speed to market and to support post-deployment lifecycle management, we created various cloud-native pipelines as you can see in the lifecycle management and pipelines box. Moving further right to support workloads with different level of criticality, we enabled the platform and made it capable to handle all DR tiers along with HA and uh, redundancy options as needed. And finally, as we firmly believe, no matter how good the platform is engineered, if the ops is not able to keep the lights on, it is all worthless. Hence, treating operational readiness as one of the core components, we upskilled our ops teams so that they can efficiently manage and support modernized workloads. So this was more about the core components uh, which are needed and in a good IIC system to kind of like make things more repeatable, more consistent, and all of that. But you, you need to have a process to kind of deliver that as well. So now that we have seen the platform components, let's look at the provisioning process. 
If you look at the task under the provisioning process, you see that these are the same common tasks used by any provisioning activity. But by leveraging the platform components, we are able to make the entire provisioning process super seamless and drastically reduce the provisioning time. Let us see how. Again, if you follow me left to right, this time under the provisioning process, you see that we start with any other, as with any other project, as a requirement gathering and uh, approvals and uh, the same uh, common stuff as we do with any other project uh, at initiation. As we move on, we will see how the platform components are being leveraged to make the process seamless. So once we have the approvals, requirement gathering is done, we start with the design part, wherein like we don't create it from scratch, we just pick an existing pattern from the library, which is already pre-vetted, and finish off the design. Here we save time, as we don't have to create one from scratch. Once the design is in place, we get an InfoSec approval, which is super quick at this time, because the design has been created from a pre-vetted pattern. Again, saving time, a win-win for both the builders and the InfoSec team. Then we move on to get the ISC code ready. Again, not writing the ISC code from scratch, but just by plugging in the values for the variables already declared. Again, saving time. Then we leverage the standardized provisioning workflow, which we discussed earlier, to quickly deploy the app with built-in governance. And finally, we have a few quick validations and sign-offs to ensure there is no deviation before it is transitioned to ops. All of this kind of works like an assembly line, allowing us to operate at scale and makes the entire provisioning process super seamless and faster. Now that we are familiar with the uh, platform, let's look at a few examples of platform components. Here's a example of a reference architecture from our library. Without getting into the weeds, the reference architecture on this slide can be readily used by someone deploying an external-facing application. These patterns are pre-vetted, CCOE aligned, and follow the best practices. I mean, if you look at this reference architecture, you can see that your lambdas are running inside your VPC, except for Edge lambdas, of course. You have got endpoints for communicating with various AWS services. Your CloudFront access to S3 is through OAI and OAC, and so on. Continuing with reference architecture examples, say you have a use case for a standalone, single region, private, or a regional API. The reference architecture on this slide can be readily used without any further modification. Again, these are already vetted by InfoSec and conformed to the best practices. Now let's look at something more involved. Here is an example of a cross-region redundant standalone API with Route 53 failover. Due to the complexity of design and number of stakeholders involved, it used to take us at least two to four weeks to get through the review and approval process. But after establishing, the pre-vetted library with standardized architectural patterns, the reviews and approvals have become more like checkboxes, saving us lots of time. Moving on to other component examples. As discussed on the platform slide, we maintain Terraform private module registry with pre-vetted IIC modules. On this slide, you can see a few examples of Lambda modules from our private module registry. Also, as discussed on the platform slide, talking about the IIC module component, we mentioned about parameterization of IIC modules to support different use cases. On this slide, you can see an example of a parameterized Lambda module. In addition to 
parameterizing the modules to support different use cases, our modules also incorporate baseline security. Here is an example of an S3 module enabling logging on the top left, enabling uh, encryption at rest in the middle left, and blocking public access on the bottom left, and restricting unencrypted object transport on the right. Also, treating ISC modules as the building blocks for any kind of provisioning activity, we mandate and enforce VCS InfoSec approvals for any updates to the modules, as you can see on the left. And along with that, we also uh, terraform central policy enforcement between the plan and apply phase of a run to ensure there is no out of policy provisioning. Moving on with other component examples, as discussed on the, pl uh, on the platform slide, we talked about the IC templates to make the provisioning repeatable and consistent. On this slide, you can see an example of a uh, VCS serverless IC template, which is used to deploy serverless workloads. Going a level down, we can see how the IC template sources the parameterized IC module, allowing us to plug in the values for the variables already declared, saving time not having to write it from scratch. Here's another example of a open API template, again, all you need to do is to plug in the values based on your use case, and no new code creation is needed. As discussed on the platform slide, we talked about the standardized provisioning workflow to ensure governance controls with faster and uh, auditable deployments. With the limited time, we cannot get into the details, but want to show you a high-level visual representation of the entire provisioning workflow. Similarly, to enable speed to market and to support post-deployment lifecycle management, we talked about the various cloud-native pipelines we created. Here is another high-level visual representation of our enterprise pipelines supporting different environments and technologies. So what have we achieved? Fabio mentioned a couple of things about the digital transformation and all of that. The most important thing from this platform is this platform acts as an enabler for our enterprise digital transformation. With this platform, we are able to reduce the provisioning time. The mean time to recovery, MTTR went down as all provision environment is consistent. We are able to leverage more serverless reducing the cost, switching to a paper execution model. This platform also provides redundancy options along with a quicker recovery. So all in all, like, uh, this platform has been a catalyst uh, for our enterprise di digital transformation. The thing here to note is we need to kind of like have the business as well as the technology, kind of like work together, make sure that like as Fabio was mentioning earlier, the technology part is simple. But getting that business to kind of like uh, work with technology and making sure that the platform aligns with your business objectives. 
And this platform was solely focused to make sure that, like, I mean, how do we evolve uh, post-migration and ensure that, like, we are able to take advantage of cloud-native services, maximize the benefits from the cloud. And I think this is what this platform has done. Some of the slides, I know, like, they were busy and also, like, uh, we don't have uh, much time to get into the weeds, but I believe there is contact information out there, so you can reach us to kind of get through that. As the famous quote from Jeff Bezos says, good intentions never work. You need good mechanisms to make anything happen. We build this platform as a mechanism to accelerate our enterprise digital transformation journey. I hope the session was helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Rehan. Thank you, Fabio. Um, I hope you found this session helpful and gives you an idea of what it takes to digitally transform uh, your organization. Um, like uh, Rehan mentioned, our contact information is over here. Feel free to send emails if you have any questions or for the deep dives. Um, you could connect to us on LinkedIn as well. And please do complete the session survey in the mobile app. This is critical for us and also helps us tweak and select content for the coming years. Thank you.